Well, it's important to be strong across the board, isn't it? I think so, because don't they count up all of your lifts rather than just one? So when I'm you, not sure. When you when you lift the bar with the circles, they're technically cylinders. Yeah, true. There's a man that so he he makes you sit down and stand up. Yeah. To a level that he's satisfied with. That's it. But I think before you do that. You have to move. You have to like hold it above you and move it till it touches you, and then not like that. No, <laughs> it is gravity's acting downwards, so that's going to be really hard on your like shoulders. I hope Bruce right. Lee could do that with a hundred pounds. Really? Really? Because I'm sure I could pass a hundred pounds through that point. Somehow. Probably, yeah. Like, if I was standing up about went like that and then just dropped it and you took a photo at the right time, it would look like I was Bruce Lee. We could do that for our new cover photo. <laughs> People would be like, whoa, he's whoa. strong. <laughs> what shall we talk about on the podcast? I was thinking about that. Um... Do you know what's funny is that when we talk and it's not recorded, all of that would make a great podcast. And then as soon as we go, like, record, it's like, <gasps> oh, cool. uh, what did we say? Uh, <laughs> I think because often if it's a normal conversation, it'll be so steeped in sarcasm that it's mm. not appropriate for the general audience because they might misinterpret what we say. <laughs> like today. <laughs> I'm recording now. So hey. we can hopefully <laughs> that's more intro fodder. <laughs> intro fodder. Hi everyone. Welcome to episode fourteen of the Propane Fitness Podcast. So it's been quite a while since we recorded one of these. Um, but we're going to make a bit of an effort to try and be a little bit more consistent uh, rather than getting um, famous people on each time. It's just gonna be Lisa and I chatting um, about things that we hope you might be interested in. So, um, this week um, we're going to discuss sleep, how to improve it, common problems, common issues, um, and ways that we found to um, work an effective sleep schedule around um, a, a nine to five um, work life, in my case, and then a, a sleep, uh, sleep cycle for a student in Yusuf's case. So, the main thing we're going to discuss is, well, the, the, the pattern that we're going to use to discuss what we're going to say um, is a model that James Clear uses um, where he divides sleep into three elements. So the intensity of sleep, the, the duration of your sleep, and then the routine around your sleep pattern. So within intensity, I think the thing that everybody jumps to is supplements or things you can take to artificially deepen your sleep. So Yusuf, do you want to touch on First, melatonin and maybe ZMA, 5-HTP, those kinds of things. Yeah, so starting at this, but it's certainly not the most important thing. This is just the uh, the order of things that we're discussing, but <laughs> it'll all come together once you've heard the rest of the podcast. So first of all, melatonin is the endogenous hormone for sleep, and uh, it's released by your pineal gland, I think. Um when you're in deep sleep and it's inhibited by blue light. So basically daylight, sky blue, being outside is going to inhibit your melatonin and stop you from getting into deeper levels of sleep. So it works in the cycle and that also means that when you're using a computer, using your phone, um, a lot of blue light, particularly at night, if you're lying in bed, texting someone, that has the potential to reduce your natural melatonin output. Um, also, if you've got a window with some thin blinds or don't have any blinds at all, even a small amount of light can inhibit your melatonin release. Also, things like electronic devices that have LEDs, anything like that, and you're very sensitive to the inhibition of that. So even through closed eyelids, it's possible that you can um, reduce the quality of your sleep 
So one thing that some people turn to is using uh, melatonin capsules. I think in the UK, these are controlled unless you get them on prescription. If you're listening to this in the States, then different story. You can also import them, um, check the legality of that in the country that you're in. Um, we're not recommending <laughs> that you uh, do anything illegal. But Recommendation number one, illegal, Im illegally import drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, we shouldn't no, have started that, with my that, that is not that is not what we're suggesting <laughs> so um, um yeah assuming that it's legal and fine in your country <laughs> then um it looks like one milligram is the appropriate dose to use so much more than that or much less than that has lower effects also um if you can you want to find either melatonin liquid or melatonin lozenges that can be absorbed under your tongue into your bloodstream rather than swallowing it and that way you should get slightly more of an effect. It is something that you can develop a tolerance for so I wouldn't recommend that you use it every night it's the kind of thing that you could maybe do two on two off or um, maybe just on the nights that you particularly find it hard to sleep or if you work night shifts melatonin is really going to be quite a useful thing to add into your inventory because obviously even if you've got great blinds you're still going to let in a bit of daylight and that's going to stop you from I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Cool. The buzzing stop. <clears throat> so if you're working night shifts Melatonin is certainly something to add into your inventory. Um, obviously, even if your blinds are really good, that's gonna the daylight is still going to block you from going into that deeper sleep. And uh, also, you, you know, you've shifted your sleep cycle to something upside down, all topsy turvy. So, um, <laughs> you know, you, you may need something to to help sort of trick your body into um, into getting into a, a proper sleep routine again. So, melatonin is something that should be happening naturally. We should be on a natural cycle dictated by normal daylight patterns, correct? Yeah, exactly. So, supplemental melatonin isn't the first port of call. In fact, I'd recommend that you don't jump straight to that. Um, the alternatives to improve your natural melatonin release, um, a lot of them we'll discuss throughout the rest of the podcast, but the main thing is stopping light from entering your eyes when you're well, stopping blue light particularly from entering your eyes when you are winding down for bed. So we've got a few recommendations for screens and things, but um, if your blinds aren't completely blackout, then you can use one of those airplane mask things too. There are a few other weird... So aside from... I will maybe discuss it more in routine, but... Um, there's a bit of people that are strange are um, wearing orange glasses like past a certain time of the day, or even like during the day to, to block out the blue light. Obviously, that has various social consequences. If you have any kind of social life ever in the evenings, then um, <laughs> being wearing, absolute dork. <laughs> <laughs> wearing orange glasses maybe isn't the way forward. Um, but as well, yeah, it's having recommendations of just in your screen exposure, um, and then getting access to blue light when you wake up. So whether that's opening the blinds, stepping outside, or you can get alarm clocks that gradually um, increase the, uh, the light as, the, as time goes on, or even lights that are used to treat seasonal affective disorder, like they emit, they emit blue light instantly um, when your alarm goes off. Sad lights. Sad lights, yeah. So um, that's the first supplement. Next thing... Um, that people commonly use would be ZMA and also 5-HTP. Now, I think it's not a good idea to immediately get reliant on sleep supplements. So, um, whereas, you know, obviously if you are reliant on them, there may be some kind of underlying issue that's uh, more serious, so always worth getting checked out. However, if you're gonna take things to go to sleep or to improve your sleep, it's also good to cycle them. So. Let's say, for example, you've got 
the full repertoire of sleep supplements. So you've got Phenibut, Melatonin, 5-HTP, and ZMA. I would rotate them throughout different days of the week so that you're not, and NeuroChill obviously, which is from Mind Nutrition, I find that really good too. It's a cortisol modulator, but taking these things, um, you can rotate them and avoid getting into uh, desensitization from, uh, from building up a tolerance from those things. You can find a link to NeuroChill, by the way, on our uh, products or affiliates page for those people who are interested. I think it's the one that we've both had consistently good experiences with. Definitely. The the temptation is obviously if you've got like six things at once just to pound them all and try and get a really good night's sleep. But, um. <laughs> <laughs> and once you've had one good night's sleep because of ZMA or whatever it might be, the temptation is to continue, continue setting uh, the, the, the supplement of that selection that I take consistently is LMA, um, and I cycle it kind of by accident because I'm I'm not great with remembering. But uh, I, I I probably know it's anecdotally a slightly better night's sleep when I take LMA. Nothing drastic. Yeah, I think ZMA uh, is probably the safest thing to take consistently, considering it is it's zinc and magnesium aspartate. So there's nothing. Um, like a neurotransmitter or anything in it um, and if you're deficient in zinc it can be quite useful. Mm. Overdoing the zinc can impair your glucose tolerance so it's not the best idea to um, you know use a high dose of it every night. Uh, sometimes the supplement companies recommend three capsules maybe just take one or two um, but yeah. I think overdoing magnesium as well um, can sometimes create a bit of a like a morning brain fog, like a sluggishness in the morning. Um, so sometimes if you buy, you can buy ZMA, which is the, I think it's made by Snack Systems. It's like their patented ratio of zinc to magnesium. Um, some supplement companies will make a similar product, which is just zinc, zinc out of magnesium in a different ratio. Um, and sometimes if you take something like, I don't know, slightly more than the recommended dosage, you might end up getting half a gram of magnesium, for example, um, which is enough to make you obviously very sleepy, but then usually still quite drowsy the next morning. So that's something to consider. Yeah, so I think generally from very, very safe. Supplements, anything else to add? On intensity, um, I think the things that affect intensity that aren't things you can take are things like how dark your room is, the temperature of the room, um, noises. So the stuff that we mentioned previously about um, blackout lights or making sure your rooms is as dark as possible. Um, there are reports that like light hitting your big toe can affect your can affect your sleep and your, the, the, deep, the depth of your sleep. Um, whether that's true or not, I definitely find that um, even if there's a little bit of light in the room. Um, and I'm aware of it, it will affect my ability to get to sleep. Um, so things like making sure you either turn your phone off or leave it out of the room. Ideally, don't have a, bed, a TV in your bedroom, if at all possible. I know that's not really a um, practical recommendation for most people. Um, not leaving your laptop in your bedroom so there's a temptation to check the emails before bed and that kind of thing. Um, and then maybe investing in either... Um, well, investing in some good lines and then perhaps investing in an alarm clock that will wake you up through some kind of light rather than just an annoying noise. Um, kind of basic what's called sleep hygiene tips. So, for God's sake, don't let any light touch your big toe. Um, <laughs> that's, if there's one thing you're going to take away from this podcast, it's that. Okay. It doesn't matter if you've got a torch shining in your face, but if it's as long as there's no light touching your big toe. <laughs> so that's intensity. Um, next one is duration. So, pretty obvious how, how long you're asleep for. This is quite a individual thing as well, um, depending on your age, gender, um, waking life as well, like how much activity you do, what kind of 
training volume and stress you put on yourself, they're all going to affect how much sleep you require to function optimally. There is some evidence as well to show that if you even miss half an hour or an hour of sleep, that can impair both your social function, emotional intelligence, as well as looks, which is pretty interesting in that they took a bunch of people who had one hour... <laughs> Johnny's cracking up here. <laughs> um, the, reason, the reason I'm cracking up is because Yusuf is studying medicine currently at uni, and things that we that we previously discussed before, um, when we discuss them again now, Yusuf just has to hand um, a selection of references or a cellular understanding of of an issue. So that's what, that's why I was laughing. But anyway, Yusuf, let's continue. Or at least. I at least pretend to have a cellular understanding of things and hope that no one uh, picks me up on the inaccuracies. So, yeah, the they took a bunch of people who were slightly sleep deprived and got a third party to rate them. And they found that uh, the same people when they were more sleep deprived were rated much lower, um, well, significantly lower on the, uh, the looks scale. So... Basically, wow. um, yeah, quite a lot of things are affected by not sleeping well. There, there is a way to, now I, I forget the name of the, the guy that did it, but it was someone who determined his natural sleep cycle by um, spending, I want to say, 30 days in, in a cave with no light. Are you familiar with that? No. No. So he, he, spent, he spent a period of time um, completely away from any source of artificial light and natural light, um, and then slept according to his just re body's requirements. Um, and that's kind of termed as being the only way to actually determine how much sleep you personally require. Um, because we're around so many artificial stimulants, um, whether it be like caffeine, um, alcohol, etc., but also um, artificial light, it's hard to determine how much you actually require on a given day because there are so many factors affecting your sleep. Um, so if you have the ability and the time to go and find your nearest cave um, and spend a month in there, then that would be a great way to kind of find your settling point. Um, but I think in terms of practically determining how much sleep you need, generally seven hours is seen as a, as a minimum. Um, anything less, you start getting interactions with well, firstly, how you feel, the things that you just mentioned. Um, and then also, anecdotally, things like hunger. I always find that if you get, if you have five hours sleep on a given day, usually you're more hungry the following day and maybe one to two days after that. Um, so I always try and see, see seven as a minimum and go for between seven and eight on average across, across the week. So um, if I get an evening of six and a half hours or six hours of sleep just due to tight schedule, then I'll the kind of the standard advice of have a line on the weekend um, so that your average sleep per night is, is greater than six and within the seven to eight hour range. Yeah, that sounds very sensible. And um, also, again, on, on sleep and hunger, if you've read my recent article on satiety, um, you'll see that there are some effects of lack of sleep. Basically, sleep deprivation, if you see it as a stressor, so you're going to increase the chronic levels of uh, cortisol and catecholamines, which will elevate your blood glucose, impair your glucose tolerance, um, your leptin sensitivity is worsened, ghrelin is higher. So basically these all lead to you having metabolic syndrome in the long term, but in the short term, higher appetite, reduced willpower, reduced impulse control, um, and uh, these things will all obviously affect your your body weight and um, appetite control in, in the long run. So just before I forget, there is another thing on sleep timing. <clears throat> so assuming you've got seven hours to, to sleep, sometimes if you find that you're waking up in the middle of a sleep cycle, um, which are 90 minutes, then you may find that um, you feel more tired than, than if you hadn't slept at all. So there's some interesting, rather than having a, uh, if you have a varied bedtime, but you have to wake up at the same time, then 
if you go on Sleepy Time, which is uh, a website, it's actually sleepytie.me, so the dot is between the I and the M. Um, you can put in what time you have to wake up, and it'll tell you when to go to bed to kind of optimize your sleep cycle. Rather than using a website, there's also an app called Sleep Cycle Alarm, which is on iPhone. It's probably an equivalent on Android. Now, that uses the accelerometer in the phone um, to determine the level of REM sleep that you're in. So if you plug in your phone, have it on the charger, put it on airplane mode probably, and stick it under your pillow when you sleep, it, that'll detect the amount of movement and then it'll set off an alarm within a half an hour window when you're moving around the most. So basically to give you the most gentle wake up rather than drag you out of the deepest state of sleep and make you feel groggy for the first couple of hours. I think, so I, I've used Sleep Cycle quite a bit, um, and there's, there's some other nice features on there, like you can you can track um, various factors relevant to that day, and it'll plot the data for you, so you'll get like a positive and a negative correlation on various factors, depending on what you might have done. Um, but the thing that I found about that with, with being in a situation where um, I have to wake up at different times each day, and often my sleep cycle is different just due to my job. Um, if I set the alarm so that it wakes me up within this kind of optimal window and I have to be up at quarter past seven and end up being woken up at quarter to seven, my initial, my initial reaction when I look at my alarm clock is, for God's sake, like, I, I would have loved the extra 30 minutes. Um, I've always thought that if somebody were to, were to sell me sleep by the minute at that time, if somebody would be standing by the back of my head in the morning selling sleep by the minute, I would give away my monthly salary just to be able to sleep for a bit longer. So um, I think it depends. Yeah, I, I'm sure theoretically you wake up feeling less groggy with with kind of the, the sleep cycle taken into account. But anecdotally, I wake up feeling annoyed and stressed. There is also the other approach, which is the, uh, the living on the edge YOLO strategy of making your half hour window half an hour later so that if you <laughs> if you're woken up at the earliest possible time that's the time that you should normally wake up and then you've potentially got an extra half an hour later which so, uh, then makes the rest of your morning more stressful but at least you've got the extra half an hour of sleep the ultimate yolo strategy is just no alarm oh man just wing it that's living life on hard mode level 42 <laughs> on veteran <laughs> One shot kill. Actually, someone told me once that if you hit your pillow, hit your head on the pillow, the number of hours that you want to sleep, or the num or the time that you want to wake up, <laughs> then you've basically set an intention to wake up at that time, and it always works. I did try it once, and it did work, but that's <laughs> definitely not a strategy that um, I'd want to risk getting fired with. Or something that we're recommending. <laughs> I mean, you can try it. Like, because someone gonna stop you. will cap their head on the bedpost, <laughs> and that's us going to court. Yeah. Also, so we do. When, <laughs> when I say hit your head on the pillow, tap your head on the pillow, not like ram it. Gently, gently place, and then move and repeat that process <laughs> seven and a half times. Yeah. So, in a, in summary, seven hours is a minimum. I think, and tracking your sleep will help because most people, when you ask them how much sleep they had the night before, they can give you a ballpark figure, but never, I think it's quite hard to know, isn't it, how sleep much sleep you had. has another benefit of, of tracking your sleep for you, and if you get like a six months or a year's worth of data, it's actually really interesting because it'll give you average bedtime, average wake-up time which days of the week you have the best sleep. Usually for me, it's Friday night because you know, after yeah. the, um, the, the week's done, um, the thing that Johnny mentioned of the correlation between, so you can put in, say, have I trained today? Have I had caffeine today? Have I meditated? Have I taken ZMA? All those things and then see whether they've had an effect on your sleep. And then the larger the sample size you get, obviously, the more that'll help. It gives you a percentage on how much of your sleep you've spent in REM compared to lighter stages and uh, also your total time in bed compared to the total time asleep. So that would be um, obviously total time asleep when you're actually asleep and then on either side of that you've got 
time lying in bed trying to get to sleep, and then also after you've woken up, how long you kind of sit and snooze for, or just stay in bed until you actually get out of bed. So yeah, really interesting insights onto that. So if you're a bit of a nerd, it's definitely worth the one pound, I think, or, or two pounds on the App Store. They'll try and flog you a secure sleep function as well, which is like a membership. Um, it keeps all of your data safe online, but I mean, realistically, the data is not that important. But yeah, it's a very low cost app, um, very effective as long as you can get into the habit of using it. Um, and you can, if you have a competition, I think we had, we had a competition for a while of who could get the best, the high, the, the largest amount of sleep and the highest percentage. And I think you've sort of got nine and a half, like ninety eight, nine and a half hours, at like ninety eight percent or something, um, which I'm yet to beat. Um, but yeah, it, it is effective um, as uh, basically revealing to you something that you may or may not be aware of. And the thing that I became aware of that was was kind of a new realization for me was that um, while I thought I was having between seven and eight hours of sleep per my iPhone, um, six and a half or less than seven was actually spent asleep. Um, and I think the average amount for someone in their mid-twenties, like myself, is, is supposed to be a 50-minute window for sleep. Um, but I think in my case, it was nearing half an hour on most evenings. Um, so that's something to consider as well. You know, if, you're, if your head's hitting the pillow at midnight and you need to be up at 7 a.m., while you think you're getting seven hours of sleep, you're, you're probably not. And tracking your sleep is a way to reveal that to yourself. So moving on to routine. Um, I think the main thing that this encompasses is when you want to change your routine. So um, in a situation where you're not getting as much sleep as you would like or you wake up feeling tired consistently, that kind of thing, how do you go about changing um, the current situation? Obviously intensity, while we can um, modulate that slightly with supplements or dark room, etc., that's kind of out of our hands. Um, and then duration, most people have a time um, in the morning that they need to wake up no matter what, unless you're in this situation, you're fortunate and you're a student. Um, if you have you know, a, a commitment to, to be out the next day or a job of any description, then generally people need to wake up at seven o'clock or eight o'clock and that can't be changed. But the routine in the evening is something that you can change, can adjust. Um, so, how do you go about changing that? You said, have you got any tips? How do you go about changing your routine evening, to get e evening routine, so that you're changing your amount of sleep through that means? I think the first thing, which is something that I'm very guilty of still, is uh, limiting screen time before bed. Um, particularly anything that, anything work related. So, if that means checking work email before bed, I mean, sometimes that's not going to be unavoidable, um, or anything that's that involves a lot of cognitive capacity. So if you're studying, it's maybe a false economy to think that you can knock out a couple of hours just before bed in the library at midnight. Um, it might be better to go to bed earlier, wake up earlier, get those couple of hours done then. Uh, also the fact that for, you know, with with student libraries, there's often, well, university libraries, there's often a uh, something fashionable about being in there quite late at night, and it becomes more of a social hub. So, just from per personal experience, you're likely to get more work done early in the morning than late at night if you're going to go to the library, and also sleep better as well. So, that's my main thing. Like, don't do anything that's going to be um, mentally intensive or stressful just before bed. Try not to start any fights. Try not to um, train within an hour and a half or two hours of going to bed. Yeah, don't hit a, a squat max 20 minutes before bedtime. Um, Especially listening yeah. to death metal and banging your head against the wall. <laughs> yeah, following on from what Yusuf says, I, I always think that um, trading an hour in the evening for an hour in the morning, you're always going to be more productive um, comparably and you always seem to get a better night's sleep if you go to bed earlier as well and um, wake up earlier 
But in terms of how, how I would go about changing your routine in the evening, um, simple things like preserving, like blocking an hour before you know you need to be in bed for your set wake up time. So when you've used your, when you've plugged in your data into sleepy, sleepy tie dot me, um, it's told you you need to be in bed by 11 p.m. Um, stop stopping what you're doing at 10 p.m. and having a warm shower, um, maybe having a small meal, reading some fiction, that kind of thing, um, just to kind of have some consistency around the time that you go to bed. Um, you know, rushing and kind of taking a running long jump into bed and expecting to be asleep in 15 minutes is, is never going to be a recipe for a restful night's sleep. So having something that is a fixed routine that never changes, um, that involves things that you find, you personally find relaxing, um, is always a way to kind of encourage your body to do what you want it to do when you want it to do that. Um, and obviously that applies to a lot of, a lot of things we discuss, everything from meal times and ingraining ghrelin patterns and hunger to um, the routine you have before you get under a squat barbell. Um, the same applies to sleep. The more consistency you have, the more repeatable um, the situation will be. Um, but something that I personally find very relaxing, um, which is very contrary to everything we've said so far, is um, I'll actually watch um, like Netflix on my laptop as I'm falling asleep. Um, and the way I get around the blue light problem is using a program called Flux, which gradually reduces the um, or changes the composition of the light your laptop screen emits over the course of the day. So it mirrors um, basically the, the sun's cycle during the day. So in the evening, um, the light is mainly orange. During the day, the light is mainly blue. Um, and I actually find that more relaxing than reading. Um, and then I set my laptop to turn itself off 30 minutes after I've gone to bed, so the light's never really a problem. Um, but yeah, so flux is another tip that we didn't discuss before that is a is a great way to attack the blue light problem. I use flux as well, and um, yeah, big fan of it. It's free and it's for Android phones, I think jailbroken iPhones and Mac PC. So yeah, definitely worth getting that. It's f.lux. I think is the website. Yeah. Um, All these trendy websites that aren't just .com. Ridiculous. Who does that? <laughs> so <laughs> if you consider the contrast between what Johnny's just said of like the two extremes, so one of them, 1 a.m., you've had a couple of diet Red Bulls, um, you're staring at this white Microsoft Word background, writing up a report that's due the next day or, or an assignment or something, just had an argument, you maybe trained an hour ago um, and generally just running at 100 miles an hour, um, you think, well, damn, I've got to get to bed pretty quickly because I have to be up early. So you run home, still mind is um, spinning with all these thoughts and the fact that you haven't finished your report or, or maybe you've just finished it, still buzzing from the caffeine that you've had within the last three hours and then rush into bed. And then get more frustrated at the fact that you can't fall asleep because of all this stuff. So you may end up actually taking longer to get to sleep compared to um, having flux on your computer, um, stopping screen time by, say, 9 p.m., maybe having a, 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 a starchy carbohydrate snack before you go to bed, maybe having a 10-minute stroll outside just to wind down and boxing off that, that time before you go to bed. Perhaps you have a meditation routine that you can do before you sleep, or even just for the sake of um, unloading your mind from any of, uh, any of the stresses of the day. I think it's quite a good idea to have a conscious process of taking what's in your brain, imagining you're putting it into a box for the next day, because you're not gonna be solving any of those problems overnight, so you can certainly put them on hold and just some people visualize putting any of the problems of the day into a box and leaving it at the end of their bed or, or outside their room before they go into their room so that their bedroom becomes a sacred place. And speaking of that, um, people often talk about making your bedroom and your bed particularly sacred by not spending time reading or or using a laptop in your bed, trying to reserve it only for sleep and sex, 
and that way you can then um, you're kind of automatically associating your bed with sleep. Yeah, definitely agree. Um, I've never understood people who like eating dinner in their bed and that kind of thing. It's just not for me. You end up feeling hungry when you're trying to go to sleep and sleepy when you're trying to eat. It's a nightmare. Um, but yeah, so I think I think we've, we've covered pretty much all of the the fundamentals um, with regards to sleep. It might have seemed a little scattered, but hopefully you've uh, you've got something useful from um, from the last half an hour. Um, and it's worth mentioning as well that we discuss a lot of lifestyle-based things in, in these podcasts, not necessarily just um, how to increase your bench press and that kind of thing. That's something that we include in our 10-week protocol course for a reason, um, because we think that those things kind of piece together and it's about a, you know, it's the standard, in inverted commas, it's a lifestyle, not a diet type of approach. Uh, and you should get the sleep as the obvious benefits of um, you know, improving recovery, improving how you feel during the day, but then also it's going to improve diet adherence, it's going to improve your adherence and, and energy that you can apply in the gym, that kind of thing. So it's, a, it's often seen as kind of the third um, leg to your tripod as, as regards to diet training and recovery and sleep. Um, so yeah, I think that's everything. Anything else to say, sir? No, I think we uh, covered most of it there. Guys, um, if you think that the, the choices that we have of, of what we think are interesting to drone on about are not very interesting to you, then please post on the Facebook wall, let us know what you want to hear us discuss, and uh, we'll draw up a podcast just for you. We certainly will. Um, all right, well, thanks for listening, and uh, we will speak to you soon. So that's bye from Johnny. Bye from you, sir.